everyone. We hope you had a great holiday season. We're so excited to kick off another year of Shouting Love. Our first featured family of 2019 is a story unlike any we've ever shared. In this two-part episode, you will meet Rebecca, who is the mother of a thrill-seeking five-year-old girl named Ellie. They live in the Chicago area, but their fascinating journey started together in Ghana. Their story is truly inspiring, and we're so excited to introduce you to this awesome family. One of the themes you will hear in the episode is Rebecca sharing how Ellie and all people are worthy simply because they are human. This powerful message resonated with our whole team, and we instantly knew it would drive the design of January's Ellie-inspired t-shirt. The Worthy t-shirt includes a thumbprint to represent our shared humanity, but also our unique gifts and challenges. But it's not just any thumbprint, it's Ellie's actual thumbprint in the design. Head over to our website, goshout.love now, and pick up your Worthy t-shirt and other items to support two awesome gals. Thanks for listening and shouting love with us. Hey, Rebecca, thanks for um, letting us come into your house today, and we're so excited to um, share your and Ellie's story with our Go Shout Love community, so thanks for having us in your home. We really appreciate it. Um, so te- we are in um, the Chicago area. Tell us, explain, it because I did not do a very good job of looking while we were driving. Where are we in Chicago area? We are about 10 miles west of the city, so we're still considered suburbs, but it takes about 45 minutes to get into the inner city. Because there's always traffic. Okay, gotcha. One of the things that I love, and I've been so looking forward to this conversation, is that your story is unique from every family that we feature has a unique story, Mm -hmm. but your story is has different characteristics than a lot of the families that we feature. One, in that you're a single mother, Mm -hmm. and two, in that Ellie is adopted, and not only adopted from, you know, just adopted, but even from another culture. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'd really love to just kind of start at the beginning and hear your story. Um, because your story into motherhood doesn't start if you don't follow some sort of leading to do something outside of the comfort zone. And that mm-hmm. happened for you even right out of high school, right? Yeah. So st- let's start there. Just tell us how you got started uh, and what led you, like where you did after high school. Yeah. So in high school, I was focused a lot on film and television. I fell in love with storytelling, telling my own unique story as well as helping other people tell theirs. And so there was a documentary film company that was traveling from Morocco to South Africa by public transportation only. And they needed an intern who was U.S.-based. And so I applied at 17 thinking, they're never going to pick me. There's so many more qualified candidates out there. And they did. And so I interned for them for a year and watched their journey from Morocco to South Africa. And they were filming nonprofits along the way. So they were focused on unsung heroes and unknown stories. So they got to Ghana and they met a nonprofit called Light for Children. So you were still based mm -hmm. in Chicago. Yeah, this was in high school. You were interning. Yep. Gotcha. From here. But with the time change, like I was up all night. Mm -hmm. Um, Good for you. It was a passion that I loved. (laughs) And I was hoping that it would turn into something more too. So they got to Ghana and met Light for Children. It was run by two Ghanaian men who were focused on reaching the HIV positive children in their village who whose parents died, but they were being raised in an extended family. So their kind of motto is that they don't really believe in orphanages. So they wanted to keep the kids in their family unit and in their culture. Um, so they were supporting them through medical care, through education, through helping the family start small businesses, really becoming self-sustainable. Mm-hmm. And I kind of just fell in love with what they were doing and that it was local. It wasn't some big international organization. It was two Ghanaian men who were helping their neighbors. And so they, um, once I found out about the organization, they posted a a thing on Facebook asking for interns. And I was like, okay, I guess like I would love to go. So I was originally planning on going for two weeks to do kind of help finish the documentary that the company had started Um, as well as just learn about the organization and see if maybe in the future there was something that I could go for a longer period of time. And I went to book my flights as, you know, an 18 year old, just about to graduate high school. And suddenly I changed it to three months without telling my parents Oh my right when I booked it. And then I booked it and that was that. So for whatever reason, I just felt compelled to go for three months. So I booked it the day that I graduated high school up until the day before I started college. So it was, and you did not tell your parents that. How did that conversation go? They were like, how much were these flights and are they refundable? They were just 
scared for their daughter, which sure. now I have a daughter and I couldn't imagine my daughter going across the world right. for three months. Right. But they trusted me yeah. and they looked up the organization and saw that it was credible that I wasn't going to go over there and be harmed or anything else. Yeah. Um, so I flew. I want to pause your story right yep. there. So where, where did your, where do you think your passion, you mentioned the passion for service. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? Where, where do you think, what's the source? Is that from your family? Is that I would say twofold. So my dad is a teacher and my mom is a social worker. So they're both in service fields. And my mom works at um, a children's hospital, which now Ellie goes to. Um, and so I kind of grew up in the hospital around my mom and around her families. And also I went to a high school that was very service oriented. So they um, required service hours. And I went like five times above the requirement. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a big part of it as well, that it yeah. was just kind of a community of service. And there was almost an expectation to be more than yourself. And so I kind of just naturally yeah. kind of took that yeah. on and that's what my life has turned into now. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay. So back to, back to the progression. Mm -hmm. So you booked a two week flight, just kidding, three months yeah. without telling mom and dad, then what happened? And I left two weeks later. And so I lived with Mike and his family for three months. There was no running water, limited electricity, no internet whatsoever. I was in the middle of a full village. And so I you know, picked up the language. I wore the clothes. I ate the food. I tried to be as local as possible. And they wanted that for me. They kind of felt my personality and thought like, you know, she's somebody that we want in our community. So yeah. I was welcomed in from day one. So during those three months, I taught in a summer school class. I um, met all of the kids that they were sponsoring learned about the organization and what all that they do. And their entire kind of task force is local. I was the only foreigner, which yeah. I loved. Oh yeah. I wanted to use my skills to help build them up because they needed to know more about, you know, the internet and Facebook and how you can use social media to fundraise. Um, and they just didn't have those skills. And I thought, I can do that. I don't know. You know, I can't fully speak the language. I don't know how you are building, you know, constructing your buildings, but right. I know these things. How can I use my skills to help you? Because yeah. um, I don't believe in handouts. I believe in hand ups. Right. If I'm entering anything into Ghana, I want to work myself out of a job. Right. So I want to be at the point where I can step away and it can run by itself, which is what I did. So I built um. There was this, this summer school class, and they I said, what do you want for your community? Because I'm a, a white person coming in. I don't know what's best for your community. I'm not you. I don't know what your challenges are. And it would be bad for me to assume that I can know right. what your challenges right. are. And so I said to these, um, there was 50 12-year-olds. I said, what do you want for your community? What would help you? And they said, well, we really want computers. We want to learn about the outside world. And we really want books. I'm thinking there's thousands of libraries in the U S filled right. with books. And these kids are asking for books. Um, and then they were talking about how they really liked art and how art helped calm them. And they felt like they could, you know, jump into doing artwork and forget about their, their lives for a minute. And so yeah. I said, okay, then draw it, build it. And they came up, they drew a structure that would be this, they were calling it the education center. So a computer lab, a library and an art center. And I took that, went to Light for Children, and said, how feasible is this? And they said, completely, let's do it. So we went to a contractor and found that it would be $60,000 mm. to build it. Um, and this was all during these three months that I was in Ghana. And he said, I bet we can take this a step further. Let's get land donated and build it, build this huge center, almost like the baseball, the miracle field. Yeah. Um, build it and they'll come. And so over the next two years, I fundraised the $60,000 and would fly back and forth to Ghana while I was in college here in the U.S. And we built the education center oh of these gosh. kids' dreams. Um, so now it's running right now. We have 25 computers, 2,500 books, and an entire art therapy center in Ghana. And these kids saw their dream come to that real life. That is so cool. Yeah. So I spent a year running it and then handed it over to a local Ghanaian. And right now it's fully funded and fully run by Ghanaians. We have solar power um, that's regenerating itself. So there's really no financial aspect of it. And they run like computer classes at night for the adults. And then they pay like $1 equivalent. And that goes towards the internet cost. Wow. So they're running their complete center and I was able to step away. So but you that started fast forwarded that, a ton. But you started that at 18. <laughs> yeah. That's so awesome. So you spent your three months mm -hmm. in Ghana and then you came back and I started did. college. Yes. 
I can't, started college. I flew to Chicago straight from Ghana and then flew to Savannah, Georgia 10 hours later. And I went with one suitcase and that was all that I had. Um, and a whole lot of memories and everything in sure. Ghana still reintegrating back into American life that first time was extremely, extremely hard. Yeah. Um, cause then I was thrown into college and all that that entails. Right. And after a semester at SCAD pursuing documentary film, I, I, it wasn't for me. I kept thinking, you know, I'm can use my skills so much better in Ghana right now. And I don't think that this is worth it for me. Yeah. So I left SCAD after a semester and then did a semester in East Africa for like a gap year. So we traveled through Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania with a group of five college students and a leader. And we went and volunteered at nonprofits throughout those countries. And then we're getting college credit for it because my parents' thing was they didn't want me to drop college completely. Sure. They um, wanted... You know, they kind of had this idealized view of what they wanted for their daughter, which would be, you know, college, get married, have kids, that whole transition, kind of the American dream type. And that's okay. They had 18 years of that built up of almost an expectation. And when I went to Ghana, that kind of shattered for them. So they were... Did it shatter for you as well? Or it had you... I don't think I wanted it yeah. ever. I always knew that I was kind of different in a sense. So you didn't... You, the your heart coming back with your heart still in Ghana did not surprise you. No, not at all. Gotcha. I, I figured that was going to happen. Um, and that did, yeah. <laughs> but my parents didn't go there. They didn't meet the kids. They could know their stories through social media, but sure. they weren't there. They didn't feel that country and that culture. Yeah. Um, and so it took a couple of years actually for them to kind of come around to like, this is Rebecca's path. And then Ellie came into the picture later and that yeah. was a further sure. changing of what they thought life was going to be like for me, sure. Um, where I was just kind of rolling with it. Yeah. What was the path that took you to the orphanage? So in, let's think, I was going back and forth for from age 18 to 20, working on this education center. And then um, at 20, I felt like I just needed to move there. I talked to my, I then had transferred to DePaul in Chicago. And I said, how can we make it so I can live abroad and still get the college degree that my parents want? for me to get. And they said, let's do it. They said, we have a ton of African professors. We have a ton of international professors. They will understand. Um, so I did my senior thesis as a sophomore and basically did all of my like capstone senior classes two years before. So then I was able to move to Ghana and just do online like general education classes gotcha. and they made it work for me. That's so awesome. when I was 20, so January 7th of 2014, I moved to Ghana permanently with no return ticket and two suitcases of toys basically and I thought this I just got to figure it out mm -hmm. I would regret this a million times over yeah. um, so I moved and I continued to work for light for children and they also worked in some partner orphanages and foster homes and so I would go and kind of volunteer and say see like what their needs were you know can we provide you a new a washing machine that would that help can we provide you know can we paint your rooms can mm -hmm. we give you new cribs how can we meet your physical needs as well as there was volunteers that were coming in and out so there was one foster home that i had really really loved because their whole thing was reunification so they would if there was a mother who died in childbirth they would keep the babies up until like age two or three and then reintegrate them back into their family um because they were kind of past the point of neediness as an mm -hmm. infant. And so then their biological fathers or extended family would come and pick them up. And I loved that they really wanted family units and they yeah. weren't for, you know, international adoptions. They wanted domestic, domestic adoptions, domestic foster care, and then in extended family. Yeah. So I was there frequently going back and forth, um, seeing, you know, all of the kids. And so I had that I knew that they were there. Um, Ellie came into the picture, if you want me to jump into it, because sure. it'll yeah. jump yeah. kind of close. Um, I had never worked at all with special needs kids before, never really had an interest. I had, when I was younger, a lot of bad views of people with disabilities, and I'm almost ashamed to say that now. Um, I just wasn't, I didn't know a lot. I wasn't surrounded in my schools. There weren't people with disabilities at all. Mm -hmm. And in my communities, I never met anybody with, you know, any range of disability. So they, this community was kind of just far, I didn't know anything yeah. about it. Well, I was first so of all, let uneducated. Me, let me tell you that that's not, you shouldn't feel bad for being honest about that because... I feel like there are so many people, and I've learned so much through this. Um, there are so many people that are kind of part of our tribe and that they are, and we kind of see ourselves as part of this 
we're a movement to kind of help fill a gap yeah. between the realities of families with special needs and those who want to be advocates right. on behalf of and want to be supportive, but they just, they've never had to experience. Yeah. So they don't know the I realities no of the day to day. So don't be, <laughs> I appreciate you being honest about yeah, that. Um, I had no idea. And now being on the other side, I do want to help bridge that yeah. gap now for people to understand my family and to understand my daughter, but I was completely uneducated, um, especially more so in Ghana because I mean, I was then seeing people with disabilities and kids with disabilities um, and not knowing what, how they, their culture viewed that because they view very differently than, yeah. than the U.S. But I got to know about um, meet kids with disabilities through Life for Children, the organization. So we... Um, can, can I pause you there yep. for a second? You mentioned that they, the culture tends to view children with special needs mm-hmm. a little bit differently than we might in the States. What do you mean by that? Many people in Ghana view children with disabilities as cursed or burdens. So they have a widespread cultural belief that there is kind of like this mystical god of the sea who will come and implant a child with a disability in a mother's womb because she or someone within her family did something wrong, mm-hmm. uh, whether minor or major. And then they, um, she gives birth to this child um, to cause stress on the family, a financial burden, um, and they, many people believe that they are not human children with disabilities or that they, you know, aren't, can't be educated, shouldn't be given any medical care. Um, they, it, yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how else to describe it. Yeah. Uh, it's heartbreaking mm. for, for to see that in real life. Yeah. Um, and they are not valued. There's really no special needs schools. There's only a few um, hospitals where ter- will turn kids away. Um, so they will think, you know, if I'm around this person with a disability, then I'm going to get that disability myself. Right. And or, I would assume that if a family uh, still embraces that child, they're, quote, cursed. Yes, they're ostracized completely. Yeah. Um, so most children with special needs are hidden away from mm. society in mm. Ghana. Um, quite literally, sometimes kids are locked into rooms. And that family might love that child, but know that they need to keep up their their appearance in the village because otherwise they're going to be kicked out. Right. Um, and other times it is for not so good reasons. The parents really do not love the kid sure. and want to dispose of them, basically. Mm, mm. Um, so they're seeing human lives as disposable. Um, mm. This all came to pass. How I got to know about this really was through Light for Children. We were I was building a library in a village and we pulled up in a taxi into the village. I opened this door, the door, and this little boy is bolting towards me. And I'm thinking, do you know who I am? Because I've never been here. He comes up to this close to me, and I see the physical features of Down syndrome. Mm. And I'm like, open my arms, and he jumps into yeah. me and starts like babbling off in things that I can't understand. And I looked to Mike and said, do you know who this boy is? And he said, oh, yeah, that's Domfei. Everybody loves him in the village. Um and so he like walked around, walked me around, showed me this whole village, um, took me to his parents' house, and I the whole time I'm seeing him, you know, loved and welcomed and accepted. And I'm saying to Mike, "Do these people know he has Down syndrome?" And Mike says, "What's Down syndrome?" <laughs> and I looked at him and said, "I pulled up a picture on my phone and said, look, his facial features are very similar.'" And he said, "Oh yeah, they are." And then I explained what Down syndrome was and chromosomes and how all of that works. And he said oh, nobody in this village thinks that there's anything wrong with him. They just think that he's, like, excited and joyful. Yeah. And I said, and Don't we're going to keep anyone. it that way. Yeah. We are not going to tell anybody. And so I explained to Mike, you know, what more of what Down syndrome was. And I said, can we, you know, just ask the family, like, does he have any heart? Do you think he has heart problems, which is very common with Down syndrome? Because I'm thinking, you know, if he has a heart defect, we should get it fixed. Right. But if not... We're hands off. Right. And we went to his parents and they were just talking so lovingly about him. And I said, is he in school? And they said, yeah, he's in kindergarten. He likes to go in the classroom, but he always walks out and then he walks back in. So they just let him go in and out. And I thought, okay, well, so yeah. we'll just go with it. Yeah. So they didn't see him as, as they cursed. They were inclusive of him because they didn't know. Right. They, because they didn't, they didn't know. They didn't have a label to put on him. They didn't. And nobody had ever told them. Right. If they took him to a doctor, which this village was extremely, extremely rural, they would likely never see a doctor. The doctor would tell them, you know, he has Down syndrome and all of these things are wrong with him. Whereas this family is viewing him in such a positive light. 
And so Mike and I are both like, we are not going to tell them, yeah. but look at how amazing. And I walked away thinking, this is what I want Ghana to be like. This is what I want children with disabilities in Ghana to feel like, and yeah. to know, to have education, to have loving parents and families. Um, so I went from that one day to the very next day learning about a child who was um, left on the side of a river who has who was missing his lower half of his arm. Just that. It's amniotic band syndrome. It's very, you know, simple. There's yeah. nothing neurological. Right. Um, he was abandoned right next to a river and hoping that he would die and then the god of the sea would come and take this child. So mm. then that mother was not burdened by him anymore. So I went from seeing Domfe completely loved and accepted to then seeing a child literally thrown on the side of a river. Mm. And by the time that Mike and I could get to him, he had already passed away. Um, so that's kind of what spurred inside. Like there needs to be something and I don't know what it is, but if, if I need to find the Ghanaians who are working to help this and then I need to figure out what I can do myself. So that kind of started the organization called the treasured ones. And, that meeting Domfei and this other child long before I knew about Ellie was what, you know, pushed me into helping children with disabilities in Ghana. So that first started with opening a foster home. So I... So you started mm -hmm. the Treasured Ones? Yeah. That's amazing. Yes. (laughs) So you have done... I mean, we're at age uh, 19 in your story? uh, Mm, 21, yeah. 21, okay. So you've done more in... (laughs) three years than <laughs> most of us will do in a lifetime as far as making a difference for other people. And I, I can't just gloss over that. If it was moment. for one kid, that would be enough. Like every single child matters. And whether I've helped, you know, a hundred thousand through the education center or just Ellie, if Ellie alone was it, that would be my entire life's work. Mm. Um, so that's how I viewed it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm but... <laughs> sorry to disrupt. No, but I didn't want to just like, Scroll over this idea that when most of us at that age are making poor choices or whatever, like you embraced life, you embraced others' life, which is incredibly powerful. Um, It didn't feel anything less than normal to me, which that was just what I was meant to do. Yeah. Well, (laughs) it's it's incredible. Thank you. And you're to be commended for sure. Um, So you... Uh, this you said it started with uh, cre- starting a foster home. Yeah, so um, the foster home came about because these children were being many kids with disabilities were being abandoned, and also there were orphanages in Ghana who had children with disabilities who didn't want to, didn't want to or couldn't take care of them. And I um, had lots of connections to medical professionals here in the U.S. who you know, could help advise me on how to best care for these children. And then I had also built up quite a network of Ghanaian doctors who did not believe that they were cursed and were willing to help me. Mm -hmm. So I thought I have all of these resources as well as, you know, fundraising through social media. I can, I can really help these kids. So we opened the first with a teenage um, mom. She was 16 who gave birth to a child who was missing two of his, um, two lower halves of his arms. And she was kicked out by her family because they said, you know, you must have done something wrong to give birth to this wicked, Mm. you know, cruel child. And so I picked them up from the hospital and they came home and Kwabana was two days old at that time. So it started with a teen mom and her um, son with a disability. And Um, just you? Me as well as I hired Ghanaian staff. So it was not me by any means. I was doing a lot of the behind the scenes administrative work and I had you know, hands and feet helping me yeah. in Ghana. So I had a nurse and an, um, nannies and a cook and a security guard. Um, it was very small. We were in this kind of gingerbread type house. The outside of it was purple and pink and yellow, <laughs> and it was the best house ever. And it was big enough for, for all of us. Yeah. So we started with him and then the, everything started flooding in of like calls all day. My phone was not stop ringing. We have this kid. Can you take this kid? Can you take this? And I had to kind of be selective on sure. on who I could and couldn't take, knowing that I had, you know, only so many beds, only so many staff right. members, only so many, you know, funding available is what a lot yeah. of it came down to. Um, so through all of that, this connects back to the the orphanage that I'd worked in before because I'd written a blog post um, about this orphanage and how much I had loved that they wanted kids to be in families. And so I get an email back this was January 2014. It was half in English and half in the, their Ghanaian local language. And it said, um, 
I have two twins who are underdeveloped. Can you take them? And I'm thinking, what? what? Where are you from? Who are you? And how did you get access to the internet right. to email yeah. me? So he left a phone number, and I will never forget this day because it was like two weeks before I was going to turn 21. And in Ghana, the legal age to foster is 21. So you're running a a foster center. Yeah. Without even before you're even legally at age to be a foster parent. Correct. Yeah. If it was an organization. You can be, right. yes, younger. <laughs> I, yeah. And because I had a teen mom, she was technically having custody of her son. Yeah. It was all these logistics to yeah. figure out. Um, but yeah, I was going to turn yeah. 21 two weeks later. And so I called this number and a man answered and he explained that he had twins who were in a very, very dire situation mm. um, and they needed to be taken out of that situation. And I went back and forth with him and on what he wanted to do because he was not these children's parents. He was an extended relative, but he had a very good heart and wanted what was best for them. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, I have this foster home that I, I can't take the kids into my direct foster home because of this capacity issue. Um, and the whole 21 thing. Right. <laughs> but I said, I have this other foster home that we can place them in. And then once I'm able, once I turn 21, I can take them in. And he said, okay. And so two weeks later, I think it was January 23rd, I was going to turn 21 five days later. Um, they bring the twins down. It took 12 hours on a bus and I didn't have any real information about them. I knew that they were quote unquote underdeveloped, but that could mean anything sure. in Ghana. Had, yeah. Um, and so I met them at the foster home that, or at the, at the orphanage that day and saw them and thought, there's no way these kids are going to survive mm. through the night. Mm. None. And what age were they at this They time? were nine months old. So okay. this was Ellie and her twin brother, Prince. And I saw them, and they both fit in the palms of my hands. Mm. They were probably four pounds, three pounds. Um, and they were completely stuck in this position mm. because their muscles were so tight. And I looked at them and said, gosh, you have CP for sure. Right. And it's spastic. Um, and there were just – they were – lifeless. I mean, there was not, you look in their eyes and they, there was nothing looking back at mm. you. Like it was a blank. Um, and I was scared to love them and to get to know them because I thought they were going to die. Mm. And I was protecting myself and thinking, yeah. how can I love these two humans when I'm going to have to likely bury them really soon? Mm. And that kind of held me back. And looking back on it now, I regret that. Because I wish I had it in me to, like, literally love them everything from the start because that's what they needed. They just wanted people to love them um, and care for them. But I left them there that night and told the orphanage workers, you know, call me if anything happens. I told them kind of the signs of, like, if they're breathing fast or if um, they're, they won't open their eyes for a long period of time to call me. And so I went to sleep and didn't sleep at all that night and woke up the next morning and I didn't have any phone calls. And so I thought they made it through the night and I went back to visit them the next day and they were still in their kind of same condition. And so I had called a nutritionist from the hospital and brought a bunch of people over to look at them. Um, and they started them on a, like a high calorie formula. And so this from where I was living with my foster home to the orphanage where they were living was like a four-hour bus ride. Oh so my. four times a week, that's one way. Yeah. So four times a week, I would get up at 5 a.m. and get on the bus, go and spend a couple hours with them, feed them their lunch, and then take the bus back. Mm. And then come home to like my own, yeah. you know, a whole Your thing. Your normal, My normal life. nonprofit yeah. running all of this life. Um, and so I, they started gaining weight really quickly, and I saw them come alive. Um and I thought I was seeing them as a child that like I was sponsoring them almost in a sense, mm -hmm. like I was providing their physical needs, but I still had this block in me of like, I don't think I, I don't know that I can take them in. Like, this is a lot because they both, um, were severely malnourished. They were very clearly neurologically, uh, different. Mm -hmm. Um, Ellie very clearly had microcephaly. Um, their arms were like curled up in their body, their legs were curled up. And I thought this is way too much for me to handle. Mm -hmm. And so I kept visiting them over the course of six months and saw them more and more. And of course I fell in love with them. Yeah. And the day that it clicked, I walked into the orphanage and they were in this back 
crib by themselves. The two of them were always in the same cot. And I walked over to them and I just looked at them and I weren't, wasn't seeing them as my sponsored children. I was seeing them as my own mm-hmm. kids. And that was when it changed. And then I thought, okay, let's take them home. Mm-hmm. You know, I got to get them out of here. So I saw the two of them and thought like, you are my son and my daughter. Yeah. Not, you are not my foster children. You are mine. Yeah. Like mine personally. So about a year and a half at this point? They right? are. Yeah. Almost. Okay. Like, yeah, a year and a half ish. And so I saw them that day and I thought, okay, I'm 21. Like, I want to foster them personally, not through my organization. I want to foster to adopt them. And their biological extended family gave me their blessing to Mm -hmm. do so. And so I, um, the whole government system in Ghana, the foster care and adoption sector of it, they wanted me to get my fingerprints done in the U.S. And since I hadn't been in the U.S. in a while, I had to fly to the U.S. to get all these papers and documents and all of this stuff. And so I was going to go to the U.S. for like a week and then come right back so that I could get custody of them. And the day before I was supposed to leave, I get a call from the orphanage and they said, um, Prince died. And I won't ever forget where I was sitting and what I was doing because I completely blacked out at that point. And all I could hear on the phone was, Rebecca, Rebecca, are you there? I was completely blacked out. Oh, man. And so Prince had um, gone into cardiac arrest, and they, none of, nobody in the orphanage knew CPR or how to help him in that situation. And Ellie was laying right next to him. Mm. And so they let him pass, and they had called me, like, two days later. So I, he was already cremated of sorts um so i had no body i had nothing left of my son nothing and i was gonna get custody of him two weeks later and i couldn't go back to that orphanage i had to put myself on the flight to the u.s the next day and it broke my heart to think that ellie was there without her twin brother and now without her mom i could not go though i couldn't put myself on a bus Mm -hmm. So I came to the U.S., I did my fingerprints, I got what I needed to mm-hmm. do, and I flew back in the first, I'll nev- the first time that I went to see them and only seeing one kid in the crib just about broke me into two mm-hmm. pieces. And that wasn't the day I was going to take Ellie home, and so that was even worse. You had to um, leave her there. I had to leave there. her there yeah. again, and not knowing the uncertainty of, I mean, I had no diagnosis on either of them. I don't know if Ellie had what what had caused Prince to pass away. Sure. And Ellie was the much, much, much more um, smaller twin. Prince was at least double or triple her size. So if you had gotten that call... I thought it was for Ellie. You would have assumed it would have been for Ellie. I 100% thought it was Ellie. And I checked like four times. I said, mm-hmm. are you sure it's Ellie? Not Ellie. Are you sure it's the boy? Because they would dress him in different color clothing. Like, are you sure? Go and check that you have the girl. Because they would put mm-hmm. Prince in pink stuff and Ellie in blue stuff. They looked very, very similar. Yeah. And because their heads were both shaved, there was really no way to tell who was a boy and who was a girl from physical um, features. You know, Ellie all along from that moment has had this fight in her from watching her brother pass mm. away and watching, going through what she had been through. Yeah. What brought her to the orphanage to begin with. And that's um, about the same time frame, still around a year and a half mm-hmm. when he passed yeah, away. Yeah, she was, he, Prince passed away at like 14 months, I think. Okay. And I got Ellie at 16. So there was okay. a gap in between there. Yeah. Um, so she comes then to, to live with you. Yes. Yeah, so I pick her up. And she was 16 months old and four pounds and could fit in the palm of my hand still. So tiny and had really no connection to the outside world. Um, She had no response whatsoever. She couldn't move any muscle in her whole body pretty much. She was stuck in one position. There was no emotion from her Mm. at all. I would look in her eyes and I didn't see anything coming back at me. She was very similar to when I first saw her. Um, Did you in that moment wonder if that was always going to be the case yes I did and it was a hard thing for me to say but like I had to look at her and say if this is what you're going to be for your whole life I love you because I wasn't just taking on I didn't get custody of Ellie in spite of her disability I got custody of Ellie because of her disability and that is what I've carried through my whole life with her um And so I said, you are worthy just the way you are because you are human. Mm. You are not worthy because you are, can walk and talk and, you know, 
read and write, you are worthy because you are alive Mm -hmm. and because you have a place on this earth and you are being kept on this earth for a reason. Um, And it took four hours in the car ride and she fell asleep on me, which is huge if you have an adopted kid or know about adoption. She fell asleep in my arms. And in that moment, I was like, shoot, I'm, I'm done for like this kid has me. I'm in for the long haul. And I brought her home. Um, and she was awake every 15 minutes throughout the entire night because she would wake up in terror thinking she was back in the orphanage, um, Mm. because she wasn't getting the greatest of care there. And that wasn't because they didn't like her. That was just because of resources. They didn't have anybody. So I would put her on my back like a Ghanaian style and walk her. And that first night I tracked, I walked five miles in circles around my house and around the compound around my house as she was screaming bloody murder. Mm. And that was like, this is what love is. Like love is standing up and fighting for a kid who's screaming on your back because of what she's been through. Um, And that's what we've done. I mean, I, she got her and she was like four pounds and then within six months she was up to 10 Mm -hmm. and the first time I saw her smile was the best day of my life. So she's around two at this point? Yes, around two. And she started smiling and started moving some of her body. And I had taken her to a Ghanaian doctor at that time. And we'd done a CT scan of her head. Um, And the doctor said, I don't really see anything wrong. Like, I just see that she has a small head. And I thought, oh my gosh, she has a full brain. And like, it's all there. And um, that just gave me, I think, a lot of hope yeah. because if I, if that doctor would have seen, you know, a large brain injury, I don't know that I would have kept pushing forward with the gusto that I did sure. um, because I didn't have a clear diagnosis. And then the doctor looked at me and he said, but I think from, I don't see anything on her CT scan, but wh- what she looks like right now, I don't think she will ever be able to um to walk, to talk. I think she is mute. I think she is deaf. I think she is blind. He kept adding all of these things on because Ellie was, you know, just there. She wasn't interacting with anybody. And I saw that doctor and he said all those things to me, but I didn't believe it. I said, I don't think that's the child. I don't think that is this child. And I, I almost wanted to scream back at him and saying, why, how dare you put those things onto this child when you don't know? Cause look at what she's been through and she survived. Right. Um, So needless to say, we didn't go back to that doctor. And about two years old, when Ellie was first starting to smile, I put Ellie's feet on the ground and Ellie started walking, like moving her feet to walk. And she hadn't really put a ton of weight on her legs at that point, but she started walking um, with me holding on to her. And then the next day she kept doing it all day long and I would hold her and she would just run, 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 run with her feet. And the day after that, she started standing and holding on to something. The day after that, like it was having that doctor tell her all the things she couldn't do forced her and pushed her to say, No, you're wrong. This is what I can mm-hmm. do. And that's when it started when she was like two, two and a half years old. All of these things that this doctor said were impossible. Well, and you wondered. And if, I did was too. Ever possible? No. Yeah. And when she would do these things, I was just literally dropping to the floor in amazement. Like, and then I would talk to doctors in the US and they would say, I don't know how she's doing these things. Like this is just Ellie. Yeah. So I want to stop there for just a second. So, uh, she's two, Mm -hmm. you've been in Ghana and involved in different work in different capacities for three to four years at this point. About four. Yeah. Um, and I'm assuming you stayed in contact with your parents Mm -hmm. and friends and other people from living their quote unquote normal lives. Uh, what was the, what were those conversations like? Few and far between, I would post on Instagram and Facebook, and I think people were just really confused and a bit scared of, like, you know, here's this young 21-year-old taking on a lot of responsibility, and they didn't quite... The people that were closest to me, like my friends, were like, oh, that's just Rebecca, and then the, like, kind of extended family were like, what is she doing? Yeah. Um, And my parents kind of had probably the biggest reaction of all. They did not want me to get custody of Ellie um, because they were thinking that this was 
you know, I was going to be stuck in Ghana with a child who has severe and profound special needs. I'm not, I don't have a job. I'm in the middle of college. I'm running a foster home. Like I'm doing all of these things and adding Ellie onto the plate was just going to be overwhelming. And they were coming from a place of love. Sure. They wanted what's best for me, just like I wanted what's best, what's best for my daughter. Well, and, and for, you know, trying to put myself in their shoes and, and looking from the outside, it's almost like, are we putting our, is she getting into a situation where she can't win? Right. Like it's such a hard situation that you're stepping into that, especially if you have goals out of love mm-hmm. and that you kind of see a life going a certain way, um, to see the potential for so much hurt and so yeah. much, um, disappointment mm-hmm. by being vulnerable enough to put yourself in that position. Yeah. Uh, I could see where that would be a, a hard position to be. Yeah. So them. we were kind of like putting heads on things, but giving each other our space. And we were 7,000 miles away. So that's a lot of space yeah. um, and a time difference. So I knew that they loved me and I was hoping for a day that they would see Ellie as their grandchild. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also knew that in Ghana, the age to adopt is 25. So I was 21. They were foreseeing for entire years yeah. of not seeing me and then not seeing their granddaughter yeah. as well. So I don't blame them for it. I think that that kind of tough love is what got me through a lot. Sure. Um, and they, I mean, supported us emotionally, financially, physically. They, My mom came to visit Ghana. Like, you know, they were there and it yeah. just took a little while to kind of sure, yeah, get up to the reality of what was going on. Yeah. So uh, walk us through quickly the, uh, like the process from where she was to and mm-hmm. then where'd you go from there? Oh, that's probably the biggest part. Um, So in Ghana, you have to be 25 to adopt. You have to be married and you have to be 21 years older than your child. Those are the set up adoption laws. So you're four years years under the minimum. I'm not married. And you're how how much older than the child do you have to be? 21. And I'm... So you're barely missing that one. Yeah. So I meet... You're over three. I meet none of the requirements. Zero. And the adoption laws in Ghana were changing. I mean, there was a lot going on with adoption. And so I thought that the best way to get... Ellie needed medical care soon. Um, And so I thought, well, maybe I can get her a medical visa, like a temporary visa. And so I contacted Shriners Hospitals for Children here in Chicago and um, said, you know, here's Ellie. She likely has CP. She has these orthopedic conditions. Can you help? And they said, yes, we want to help. So they offered Ellie full charity care, meaning that if she, if I got her to the U S and got her to Shriners, they would do everything for six months. And, um, they limited, it was like up to a million dollars or something, you know, a huge number. They were going to do whatever they needed to help Ellie. And, um, they were super excited. And so I went to the U S embassy in Ghana and applied for her visa and it was denied. Mm. And we applied again and it was denied for reasons that I won't go into, but they're unjust (laughs) and they were denying Ellie complete medical care. Mm. So at this point I'm 22. Ellie is three and a half. And there was going to be no way that I thought that Ellie was going to make it until I turned 25 because of her state of malnutrition. And she needed a lot of medical intervention. Um, and I thought, what can I do? Who can I go to? Is there, can this law be bypassed? And I went to the, the like university and opened a law book, a Ghanaian law book on adoption. And I was trying to find any sort of loophole that I could. And I found one that said, um, all of these laws can be bypassed if it's in the best interest of the child, which was very clear that I was Ellie's best interest. And that by bypassing the age restriction, the married restriction and the age above restriction would be in in Ellie's best interest. So I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. You know, I've got this law on my side. I can go and find a lawyer and it can be done and we can go to the U.S. And it was not that. It was 18 months of fighting Mm. um, to finalize her adoption because there were lawyers that didn't want to work with me because of her disability, because I was young, because then there was people that were trying to like corrupt the entire adoption and get a lot of money out of me, which I didn't have. Um, there were people that just didn't believe that I was in it for the right reasons. They thought I would bring Ellie to the U S and harvest her organs. Like these very, very crazy Mm. things were being said about me. Um, and so I went through a ton of lawyers, went through a ton of people, um, until I found one lawyer and I proposed what I wanted his case to be because I had already written the whole case basically and said, this is what I want to do. And he said, 
okay, we're going to need to go to the equivalent of the Supreme Court to do this. It's called high court. And so we, I, we got a court date scheduled, got all of the documents put together and we went in and met this judge and she saw Ellie and she saw me and we were basically begging her to forego these requirements. Cause I was 24, Ellie was four <laughs> and I was not married with no prospect of being married in the near future. We told her the case and she said, I think I can do it. She said, mm. I think I can write it where I won't get in any trouble. You are legally covered and this child can get to America. Mm. So we went through a bunch of court dates and this judge was literally like our angel because wow. everybody else kept denying it and saying, we can't do it. You know, you're, you have to stay until you're 25. Um, you know, you, you have to get married. I'm like, these things don't happen overnight people. Right. Like, and by the base of it, I will never be 21 years older than her. Never. It's right. just not possible right. unless you change her birth certificate it won't happen. So one was never going to happen. Yeah. Marriage wasn't in the likelihood and I wasn't going to, I wasn't close to 25. So on March 23rd of 2017, a judge finalized Ellie's adoption mm-hmm. after three and a half years. That same judge, the mm-hmm. high court. Is it yep. common for uh, female judges at the high court level? Um, I don't know. Gonna- I saw a few. Um, there was a few female judges, but Ellie's case was the first case where a judge took a stand to literally put aside the book of law to... To actually enforce the, this yes. is in the best interest of the child. Right. And going against, like, these three huge laws to go off of this one, like, clause that yeah. was in the bottom of a right. paragraph. Like, um, It makes you wonder how much uh, is there... Was that a mother as right. a judge Seeing, making that decision? And, ha- and she had to have much. a high level of education Absolutely. to understand that Ellie was not going to survive in Ghana, that right. Ellie needed to go to America for medical care. So this judge was, and at the end of it, she looked Ellie in the eye and said, you're going to do big things. Yeah. And for her to say that to Ellie, talking to her, not at her, yeah. was huge. Wow. Um, and beyond that, then the process was, um, how do I get her into the U.S.? Immigration. Yeah. And in our current state of affairs, immigration is and was very difficult. Even with, even though Ellie is, you know, adopted, an orphan, all of these things... Um, I was told that it was going to take three and a half to four years to immigrate her to the U.S. This concludes part one of this episode. However, this remarkable story is not over. Please keep listening to part two as Rebecca tackles immigration so Ellie can finally make it to the USA and begin receiving the medical care she so desperately needed. This is one special family. Thank you for shouting love and listening to our podcast.